you're gonna eventually learn and grow you see what I mean and you're gonna accumulate the skills to do the things you like doing better but the thing is they don't let anybody get into the stuff they want to do for a very long time we have to spend at least six seven years in elementary school learning basic you know nonsense brain deadening curriculum before you even get into high school where you might have some maybe a few programs of stuff you're actually interested in so you have to spend 80 percent of your time on nonsense bullshit you don't really care about just to get to that electronics class you're really interested in or that or that uh, architecture class you're interested in or you know or the CAD or the programming whatever class you're actually interested in and the funny and the, and the sad thing is that most schools in most jurisdictions don't all teach the same thing so some schools like the school I went to they they taught uh, electronics and they taught Cisco networking, CCNN, and they taught the A plus. And uh, in my personal experience, I did. I started those programs because it was a two year program. Then you could take the test for certification when you get out of high school. Well, the, the problem with my personal experience was I took those programs for a couple of years. You know, I took one year and a, and a half. And I and halfway through my senior year, my family moved to Hawaii. So we moved to Hawaii, and guess what? The schools don't have the same program. And my parents at the time were struggling for money. They weren't you know, doing that well. They just got moved there, and they had to set up a lot of stuff. So they didn't have enough money to pay for the private schools that were actually going to teach it to completion. And the sad thing is, once I went to the private schools, I would have had to start the program all over again. So through this dumb inefficiency and redundancy in the system, I lost two years of my time, and I never ended up getting the certification for it. Which would have been a pretty nice income fresh out of high school. But instead I ended up going to college and realizing there was a huge waste of time and I just dropped out of the whole thing together and started making my own money out here. Doing what I do best, making beats, running a home studio, writing ebooks, writing articles, making YouTube videos. I've thrown parties for money. And actually that's that's my main thing really, you know. I wanna throw parties for a living. And that's uh that's a good thing. I've actually had a, a good experience doing that. But to be real successful, you gotta have a lot of money to put into it. It's not. It's not something you could go in with just a couple thousand dollars and be very successful. I mean, you can gain some success doing it that way. But you know me. I, I'm all about. I'm all. I'm strongly. I'm a strong believer in the in the concentrated effort. You don't go out there and do one move or another move or something else without having a backup plan or a full campaign. That's why when people are running for election, they run a campaign. You know, I see a lot of musicians out here trying to promote their music, but they don't really have a full-blown campaign ready with the investment and the, and the fire behind it to carry them through to actually achieving real goals that they set for themselves. And most of the goals they set when you don't have a full campaign are little small, tiny goals that don't mean much. When you want to do something and have it be a life-changing event or have a life-changing impact on your life, you want, it, you want to plan it out for the long haul and make sure you have enough juice behind it before you take off. The number one cause of failure in most business ventures is that the person who started out didn't have enough money to finish it all the way through. And that's been the number one, one cause of failure in, ma in many of my business attempts is not having enough money or the financial backing to carry it all the way through. So before I make a business decision, before you start a new business or you go on a new venture, and that's something uh, that I like to bring up with multi-level marketing. Because in multi-level marketing, a lot of people will look at those programs and say, wow, those people are making so much money, it's so easy to make money with a multi-level marketing program. And they're going to spend the two, three, four hundred dollars to sign up. The problem with that is, when you spend that money to sign up, that's just the beginning. You now have to start thinking about how much money you're going to spend on marketing, how much money you're going to spend throwing parties to promote the events, how much money you're going to spend buying products so you can have stuff to sell to people right then and there. Because showing people catalogs and stuff like that is going to work but it's going to hurt you having something to sell right there is where your money is going to come from so you're going to have to have another bunch of money to buy inventory most of the time but then that's just half the battle because now you have to get people to notice you and you have to build a reputation out there you're probably going to sell a few among your friends but then it's going to get tougher because how do you who do you reach outside of your friends and a lot of marketers they use a referral system try to get referrals to keep building up on that and if you have a pretty good circle of friends that's good but most of the time, the products and the services you're selling are not a commonly used service. Now, some people try to do it with utilities also, but then you see the complexities that come with switching people over utilities. Like, 
I did it one time where I switched over to my friend's utility program so that he would start making extra money from his uh, multi-level marketing plan, whatever, uh, I think it was, uh, I know it was Stream Energy, but I don't remember which program it was. He spent like 500 to sign up with them, and he was making money every time I paid my bill, but you can see the little bit of chump change he was making, he would have to get hundreds, you know, a lot of people signed up to actually make that work. And the thing is, when you go into something like that, not to say they don't work, they all work. That's what I always tell people. Every multi-level marketing program out there works. They're all successful. They all make money. The problem is, it's not just going to be from you signing up. It's going to be from you probably spending 10 times as much time and money as you did signing up before you start seeing some real traction. So if you're not ready to put in all the work that goes behind carrying your, your venture to its full fruition, then you shouldn't really be taking the risk of going in because you're probably just going to end up wasting your money because it's not going to go anywhere. Just a tip. But the funny thing is, another thought about multi-level marketing programs is, you know, isn't, isn't it curious that when people are offering a multi-level marketing program and they, if, if they were truly confident that you could make money with the multi-level marketing program just by signing up, and by following some simple steps as they put it which they usually put it like it's some real easy you can do it, anybody can do it you know what I mean just follow these few steps and you're good but in reality if it was if, if that was true then why would they need you to pay them up front if they knew that you were gonna make an income and you was gonna make a real good income just signing up with their product and following a few simple steps why wouldn't they just let you sign up for free and then just start promoting the product for them. And then they start paying you and teaching you and everything else for free if it was that simple. Why would they need the money up front? Why wouldn't they just give people a test, determine who's good, who passes the test, and you come in and you start doing the stuff? Not to say I know the answer. I truly don't, not really. I mean, I have some thoughts about it. But I think it's more to do with the psyche of the entire human population, which is that we fear and we hate ourselves. That's the reason we can accept a society that's centered around forcing the majority of us to participate in things that we're not really interested in participating in. You know? So when you look at the school system, you have a bunch of kids being forced to go against their natural instincts. You can say God given if you believe in God or whatever else. Their natural instincts are being overridden and taken over so that grown-ups can feel comfortable, safe, have some more free time, whatever it is. So these kids are forced to go into this school that most of them really didn't want to go to in the first place. And a lot of them don't really like going there and, and the major, and a good chunk of them end up dropping out about a third. So, and the majority who stay in the school system, they don't really want to be there. They just stay and force themselves to go. I mean, a lot of people like school because they get to hang out with friends and meet other kids but that's the only reason everything else about school is completely hated and you can't even really do what you want to do in school like that there are many alternatives to how you can set up an education paradigm to where it can be voluntary to where the kids actually want to participate and to where it actually allows them to go with their instincts so it follows the kids instincts I just made a YouTube video also on my YouTube channel, uh, Dropout Rebellion, and I just posted it up. It was just a short rent. And what I said was, parents, uh, kids are to be learned from and not taught, or some to that extent, or some to that effect. Pretty much stating that children are not something that you just take over, control, and, uh, and teach, and impose your will on. Children, when you have a child, you're given the blank slate person that you get to work with and do whatever you want to do. And you get to watch this person grow, help this person grow, teach this person how to grow. But in the process, while you're doing all of that, you're the one that's supposed to be growing the most. Because you get to see your, your entire childhood replayed through someone else's eyes, but you're the one that's orchestrating it. So it's like being able to go back in your childhood and re and fix all the stuff that you saw that was wrong and reconstruct it and make it even better. So that you could enjoy your childhood again as if you was a kid, but you're not because you're just doing it with your kid. See, a lot of people don't value the experience to that extent. They don't think about it that seriously, which is why they don't. When they have a kid, they just roll with the punches. And they think that they just have to impose 
their will on the kid to control them so that the kid can perform. Otherwise, the kid's gonna end up hopeless. You know what I mean? Just a vagrant, which is not true. You know, nobody sits down and teaches their kids how to how to you know speak. I mean, you know what I'm saying? They just watch you do it and they learn because they know they need to communicate. They need to start talking to other people to get the things they want. Children come with their own visions. They already come with their own plans and they come with the stuff they want to do without your help. All you have to do is just provide the opportunities, the information, new ideas, new thoughts they might have not thought, um, thought of before and make things possible. Make things happen. Whatever they imagine and stuff, help them make it happen so that they learn how to make stuff happen. That's the main lesson. Not how to learn how to fit into someone else's scheme or fit into someone else's vision of what the world should be. But once once you understand that this entire school thing, after 12, 13, 14 years of the school system, where you're constantly being forced to do stuff that you normally wouldn't or that you don't even want to do, you know what I mean? That leaves you in a certain state of mind where you can accept taxation. Where you can accept a justice system that's abusive. Where you can accept crazy cops shooting and beating people down. Because you've already spent 12, 13, 14 years in a system where you've been forced to accept a bunch of nonsense. So the things that we're forced to participate in are the things that lead our societies to struggle unnecessarily. Because if people weren't forced to participate in certain things, all the problems would be getting solved on their own through creative means. And a lot of people are, what is it called, the, the pundits, the people on the news that would tell you, oh, capitalists and free market advocates have faith in the hand of the market because the all-seeing eye of the market. Well, the market is an all-seeing eye, and that's just common sense why that is. The main reason it is an all-seeing eye is because the market is a concept representing all people's interactions, all people's voluntary interactions. So what the market means is when you go to work and decide how much you want to get paid and decide how much you're going to pay for the food that you eat after that, all of those transactions, all of those calculations you're making, that's a piece of the entire market. And the market is comprised of not just you and your calculations, your thoughts and your actions, but everybody else who is included in the market, their actions and their thoughts and their calculations. So it is an all-seeing eye to what is relevant to the market because the market is only relevant to people who are participating in the market. And to have an all-seeing eye in the market, you have to consider the perspective of every person that is involved in that market. So by that logic, you can't sit there and tell me that uh, market ad advocate, uh, people who advocate for the market think they just have faith in this. It's not faith, it's logic, it's common sense and it's fact that if you consider the calculations of everybody and you let them make their own rational calculations and decisions and don't interfere with these people's personal internal calculations and decisions, how is it that you are not getting an all grand perspective of the whole system? How is that you're having faith in that? Having faith is that some guy in Washington DC or some dude on the internet is going to be able to sit home and figure out what all these billions and billions of people are going to want in the market by doing some math or some paperwork or plotting a chart on a simulator in the computer. Because there's too many variables to predict. We can't even predict the weather. And it's less variables affecting that than the actions of millions of billions of people. So if you can't even predict the weather to accuracy, how can you then turn around and say you could predict what all these millions and billions of people are going to need? Only they could predict what they're going to need individually. That makes sense. And you have to let them go off of that thought, that belief, or that action to achieve what they want to achieve. And you can't get in the way of that process because once you get in the way of that process, you're probably wrong and they were probably right. Which is why you cannot have any entities that just go in and actively temper with the market. Because they're going to be probably...